Photography. This is the Americans in Wartime Museum. My name is Dennis Gill and I am interviewing Andrew Brennan. We are at the Tank Farm in Noakesville, Virginia and today's date is the 12th of December. Andrew, uh, why don't you tell us about yourself? Where did you grow up? Where were you born? Sure, so I'm a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a blue-collar working class family. My father and his, uh, his brothers are all steam fitters, uh, blue-collar working class guys. My grandfather was also a fitter. He came to that in kind of an odd, odd manner. Um, they were Irish immigrants, and the family started out as coal miners in Ebensburg, PA. And then they moved to Braddock, Pennsylvania to work in the steel mills that were part of Andrew Carnegie's steel empire. World War II broke out uh, just before, they got there just before World War II started, and my grandfather's three older brothers went and served in World War II. One uh, was a ranger on D-Day, Uncle Jack, and we unfortunately don't know what battalion he was in, but we do know he was uh, a ranger uh, on D-Day. One of the other brothers was an Army Air Corps member on an aircraft, uh, non, non-pilot, non-rated crew, and again, family history, they, they didn't really keep what aircraft he was on, unfortunately. I would have loved to have known that. And uh, the other brother actually drove, um, I think they're either called a Higgins boat or an LST, and a uh, really interesting story there, the uh, LST to their front right was hit with an artillery round on the way into uh, to the, uh, to the beachhead. And uh, they slowed down and they started as best they could pull in some of the guys that had, were in the water and pulled them into there. So now they're, they're crammed in the boat. And my, um, I guess my great uncle uh, was, was driving in the driver's you know, spot. So they're packing these guys in and the guy that they pulled in and put next to him, he had graduated high school with from Braddock Catholic High School like two or three years before they hadn't seen each other since high school. Wow. So pretty wild uh, there. So anyways, the three older brothers I uh, served and then my grandfather enlisted right out of, uh, out of high school. And he was actually getting his dental done to ship. And they made the announcement. He was, he was in, the, in the dentist chair and they didn't wear gloves back then, but uh, my grandpa told the story as if, as if he, he had, and he, he said, yeah, I'm getting my dental done, and they're doing something in there, and they had made the announcement that the, the bomb had been dropped on Japan, and Japan capitulated on the radio right there in the dentist chair, and the, uh, the dentist put some cotton in my grandpa's mouth, and he, he like, he pushes himself back, and he's like, kind of like, okay, I'm going to the officer's club for the day. You come back here tomorrow at noon, and uh, so my grandpa ended up being ended up being part of the Navy, uh, the group of like replacements really, aboard ship in the Pacific because some of these guys had been aboard ship for quite a while and they needed to relieve them. And so he was part of the occupation force, less of the fighting. So yes, yeah, so my grandpa came home and he started working in, um, in the steel mill, in the Edgar Thompson steel mill in Braddock. And the one day somebody was in there that they didn't recognize, a couple guys, and I was like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, we're, we're steam fitters. Uh, we help build all the stuff that you guys work on every day. My grandpa was like, what do you guys make doing that? And they told him, and it was like, you know, 10 times what my grandpa made. And he like almost fell off his chair. And he's like, how do I get to do that? So anyways, grandpa ended up in the, in the union. Um, another interesting family military thing, Uncle Jack's son, Jackie, ended up uh, joining the Army as well, uh, was in the 1st Air Cavalry, 7th Cav, and was in the Idrang in 1965. And uh, in that November, um, my grandpa was driving into work and the KDK AM radio came on and said, you know, the first cavalry air cav is decisively engaged in the Idrang Valley in Vietnam it was breaking news. And my grandpa said, I, that's Jackie's outfit. I know that. I knew that. So about a day or two later, the, the family was notified that Jackie had been killed. He was among the 70 plus guys that got killed. He was later posthumously awarded the Silver Star, uh, we found out. but. So the family, my family, went to the Braddock Catholic Cemetery to have, you know, make arrangements to have Jackie buried. And we had the family plots, but they were actually having arrangements to have him buried in the, in the veteran portion of the cemetery. So the cemetery uh, director said, I- I'm sorry, we can't do that. And my family's like, I'm sorry, what? And he said, you gotta you got understand, it's November 1965. I said, can't do that. Uh, there, there's been no foreign war declared. 
it's a, it's a federal law, you have to have a foreign war declaration before you can bury somebody. And I never really was able to rectify that in my head because we know that we had special forces advisors as early as I think 58 or 59 that were killed who were at panel, panel one, E1 on the Vietnam wall. Um, Jackie's name, by the way, is on uh, panel E3. So, and they're, you know, in chronological order. So, uh, what ended up happening was, and again, this was the first major engagement of the war. So, an article gets written in the Pittsburgh Press about this issue. And they ended up getting qu a quote from Senator John Hines at the time, and, you know, one of the senators from Pennsylvania. And it created literally a national, that, that article went to the AP wire. And it created a national dialogue around this. And, and uh, unfortunately, Congress was in recess at the, that moment. So, they're like, we're gonna fix this, but as soon as we get back, and it wasn't gonna help my uh, my cousin any. So uh, what ended up happening was, uh, so you know, a couple of days or four or five days go by before they're able to get his remains back, and so the on Saturday, uh, Jackie was set to be buried and interned uh, at the cemetery, and on Friday, the Allegheny County Board of Directors, the county that the city of Pittsburgh sits in, uh, voted five nil or seven nil, and. Uh, they ended up declaring war on North Vietnam. So the, the news article the next morning on Saturday was County at War. And my cousin was buried uh, in the veteran portion of the Braddock Catholic Cemetery. So, so it's kind of a weird thing. Uh, my family has this like unique military history, but the reality of it, the way I grew up, like this was never a plan. Like my dad and his brothers didn't serve. Uh, they were more from kind of the 70 generation that kind of rebelled against the Vietnam War more so. And when I, so anyways, I was a junior in high school when 9-11 happened. And I had planned on going to Notre Dame and becoming a lawyer. And that left, you know, there's a lot of the folks that I ended up later graduated from West Point with. Many of us, um, you know, we were very young and impressionable as sophomores and juniors in high school. So uh, I watched the towers come down and my grandpa came and picked me up early from school that day as a lot of kids went, you know, went home early. And we did the whole initial, like, you know, hey, how are you doing? All that sort of thing. And then my grandfather said something to me that has stuck with me, you know, uh, to this day and kind of led me on, I guess, somewhat of the path that I ended up on in life. We were maybe three or 400 meters from my high school, uh, Central Catholic. And he said, the war that's going to follow from this is going to shape your generation. You need to be on the right side of that. And this is a guy that he watched Pearl Harbor happen. His brothers right. had fought. They all went for that reason. Um, so about six or seven weeks later, I came home one day and I told my dad, I said, I'm going to enlist in the Marine Corps when I turn 17 in March. I'm going to drop out of high school and enlist. And my dad's, uh, my dad's response was, the hell you are. He's like, you want to join the military? You go right ahead. He goes, but, you know. I, he had made a lot of sacrifices to keep my sister and I in, in private school, and nobody in my family had gone to college before. So my sister and I um, did both go the college route, and he, but he said, you, you have to go to college. Like, you, if you want to join the military, go ahead, but um, you're going to go to college first. So I applied to the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy because I wanted to be a, I decided I wanted to be a pilot, and I didn't get in. Um, they uh, have some pretty strict vision standards. Uh, and as uh, a lot of folks throughout history have said, oh, well, the Army will take anybody. So, um, so I had to do a year of uh, school at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh first. And then um, I reapplied to all three schools. And I uh, was fortunate enough to get an appointment to West Point, which was something that I actually, uh, today's in the Army-Navy game. So uh, it's kind of a right. big day for us. And it was something I noted today. At West Point. What was that? They're playing at West Point. It's the first time yeah. since World War II that uh, the game is being played at West Point. So, um, and there's not going to be many people in this. You know, it's like the, basically the Corps of Cadets and the midshipmen will be there, and there's some members of the Congress and some VIPs from Army and Navy. But, you know, a unique year this year for sure. And uh, so I ended up um, deciding, you know, that I was going to try to go to service school. I reapplied to all three while I was at Carnegie Mellon. And I posted this earlier today because there's a video um, that was the preamble to the game broadcast in 2007, uh, I'm sorry, 2017 that CBS did. And the, the video is about four minutes long and it did a, uh, uh, it, it shows how it started for all these kids 
whether they went to Navy, and it goes all the way back to like the 1850s. They show like a scene of, um, you know, this literally a rider showing up like on horseback with a letter. Um, and it, you know, the thing, the theme of it is like, you know, for all of them, it all started the same. And, um, and it shows this postman handing a letter to, and you know, this, this farmer literally says to his wife, he's like, he's like, he's like, you hear that? He goes, the boy's going to West Point. He's going to be an officer in the United States Army. And they, they do that for both Navy and, it, and it's through eras as well. So I was, um, the year I was at Carnegie Mellon, I was uh, coaching high school wrestling at my high school as an assistant coach. They asked me to come back and work with the, the freshmen. And, uh, and my dad calls me and he says, uh, hey, I think you got into West Point. I got something in the mail here for you. I'm like, what do you mean you think? And he's like, I don't know. It says like offer of appointment, whatever. I'm like, bring it down here. And uh, sure enough, you know, I, I got in and uh, life changing decision, you know, to, to go there. And I, there's a saying that West Point's a, a great place to get into. It's a great place to be from. It's not a great place to be. It's definitely true. Um, it's not a, not an easy existence, but I was a student enough of history to understand that, you know, the, the graduates that we have had from that school and, and Navy and all the service schools, um, they, they've they've gone on to lead the nation. And the mission statement for West Point prior to me getting there, they changed it a little slightly. But it stated that, you know, it was there to develop leaders of character devoted to a lifetime of selfless service to the nation. And when you sit and look at the fact that we've produced two presidents, we've produced secretaries of state, directors of the CIA, and congressmen, senators, uh, titans of industry on Wall Street and, um, and, you know, Fortune 500 companies, that's kind of the, the expectation there is that if you're, right. getting, you're getting this amazing opportunity in education to learn to become a leader, and there's, there's a big expectation there uh, for the rest of your life, whether you're, you know, in mortgage banking, working in a nonprofit, local government, whatever that is, um, you've been given something that you're expected to go forward and do good things from. Right. Let me let me let me stop you real quick yeah. before we get too far forward. September 11th obviously is something that's changed and shaped a generation. Um, you were in school. Where, where were you when you heard about that, and how? What was your perspective when you, when you saw it? So I had never heard of Al-Qaeda. Um, I didn't know who Osama bin Laden was. Like most, most Americans, if, you know, the only people really in the country that knew that were people in the special operations community or in the intelligence community at the time. I was walking from uh, one class. I was heading to Mr. Walker's algebra class, and somebody in the hallway in passing said, a plane had just crashed into the World Trade Center. Now, I knew that there was a small uh, Cessna or something that had crashed into a, a New York building like years prior. It was like bad weather situation, like fog. It was a clear day, uh, as we all remember from the videos. And I just thought to myself, if I were a pilot, I would have ditched an aircraft into the Hudson or the East River. You, you would avoid right. Manhattan. I didn't know anything about air corridors back then or anything. And it, it immediately just sat wrong with me. I just said, that's not right, you know, something. And literally by halfway through that next class, they turned on the TV and we were watching the video and um, we realized that the country was under attack at that point. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, being young and impressionable, uh, my class at West Point, I was a junior, so I did that year of college prior to. Most of us that showed up there were sophomores, like 80 some odd percent of my class just came straight out of high school. We were irritated, you know, we were, we were pissed off. Um, you know, we kind of wanted to go, go get some, so to speak. But at the same time, as I mentioned, you know, I, I was looking at college and all these, these, you know, it was gonna take some time and uh, to get through schooling and, and then on top of that, I ended up branching aviation. So then I had to go through flight school. And uh, so literally, I didn't show up in Afghanistan to, you know, to get into the fight, so to speak, until uh, I, I stepped foot on the ground. Uh, I think it was like October 6th or 7th of 2010. So here we were, you know, more than nine right. years from 9-11. From but our class uh, at West Point, we really, we did kind of have that mentality, I think. You know, we all expected to, to join a military and an army at war. 
and we expected to lead America's sons and daughters in combat, which uh, to this day, and that's something that I, I put today on LinkedIn, I, I put that video up and, um, and I put a little commentary on there. I said, you know, I don't foresee in the future of my life, I'm not necessarily sure that I'm ever going to do anything as important as what I did at the age of 24, which was having the responsibility of leading America's sons and daughters in combat and flying an aircraft, uh, you know, downrange. Um, while the outcome and the history books are going to show that Afghanistan was probably a waste of our time, uh, it's that thing that you always, you know, develop between, you know, soldiers and sailors and, and folks that have been in combat together. Right. Um, you don't do anything for for king and country. You're there to support the people on your left and your right, and, and be there with the folks that you're, uh, you're you're in your company or your platoon or your crew. So, um, so yeah, I uh, that was kind of, I guess, does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us about um, briefly West Point. What, what's that like for a young guy? So again. Um, I like to put things in historic perspective, right? So you look at what MacArthur had to go through to join the old, the old boys club, so to speak, um, and get through that. And, and, and what the, the harassment and the, the hazing and the cost of admission was in that era, right. night and day different than what I went through. But I'd also gone to college for a year, and I knew what living in a frat house for a few months was like, and I knew what living the good life in college was. I knew what I was giving up. Uh, and I knew what the place was about. Some of my classmates showed up. I don't think they had quite done the research, knew what they were signing themselves up for. Uh, and that's indicative, you know, and, and or, or, uh, I guess the proof in the pudding there is, you know, we started with, I think, 1,243 uh, over the summer. First person quit within, you know, like an hour and uh, showing up. And we graduated, I think, 960 something. So I mean, we lost, you know, almost 25% of the class. Uh, which is, I think, about normal. And when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I was on a full scholarship in uh, Navy ROTC, and I was set to eventually become a pilot. So the things that I kind of wanted, I was going to have. And Carnegie Mellon's no slouch school. Like putting a degree on your wall from, you know, from there is, is uh, probably going to put you on an okay path to success in life. But I wanted more out of the officer training and I didn't really like the, the uh, we'll say the culture at Carnegie Mellon. So what I say, because uh, people are asking me like, well, why are you leaving here to go lose a year of college? You know, you're, you're not gonna gain a year. You still have to do four years up there. You're setting yourself back a year. You're gonna get all the things that you kind of want now. Why are you choosing a more difficult path? And it kind of gets to the, you know, the Robert Frost poem, the road less traveled. You know, I wanted the, the more challenging environment to, to what, like, learn. And I, and I thought that, you know, and, and granted, you can you find amazing officers that come out of OCS, come out of ROTC, but I wanted the best possible training, and I viewed that as uh, going to a service school was, was going to provide that. So the one thing that I, I didn't know how to answer that question I was being asked when I was in ROTC about why I was doing it. And after having gone through the academy, when you're at Carnegie Mellon, you're surrounded by 1,200 smart people, your classmates. But like Karen's in a theater major and she wants to go act on you know, Broadway and, and Luke's a IT guy, computer science, and he wants to go work in Silicon Valley and you know, on down the line. When you go to a place like West Point or Annapolis or the Air Force Academy or the Coast Guard Academy or, or even the other you know, non federal service academies or, or you're in the Corps of Cadets at Virginia Tech, whatever that is, you're surrounding yourself with 1,200 motivated people who are also all pretty smart and your focus is on the job that you are going to do after you graduate. You're going to be a platoon leader. You're going to lead America's sons and daughters and in our case we knew it was going to be in combat we're all signing up to do the same job. And uh, it makes kind of suffering through the discomfort of that place a lot more digestible. And also, in just like any other training pipeline, and whether you're in special operations or you're going through officer training, whatever it is, um, there are always people that 
make it through the pipeline that probably shouldn't be there at the back end and they skated by. But all in all, the people that I graduated with are some of the most impressive people I have ever been around and met in my entire life. And wouldn't hesitate to go to war with most of them. And I think the, the answer that I would have given is, you know, you surround yourself with 1,200 motivated people who are all going to do the same thing and are committed to the same ideals. And it just, like I said, it makes dealing with the discomfort of the place that much more. Um, and, you know, lifelong friends, just good people. And uh, so that was kind of the, the experience there. And, and by the way, the academics, I mean, Carnegie Mellon is like a top 20 ranked school. I had like a three, two, four at Carnegie Mellon when I transferred. And uh, I also didn't put a, not all, as much effort in, I don't think. And then when I went to West Point, I mean, I, I got out of there with like a 319. I just, I wanted to be ranked high enough in the class to, to get aviation out right. Um, and that was aviation and infantry were the two branches that were selected, uh, you know, at the top of the class. And, and those branches are handed out, at least in my area, they're handed out by order of merit in the class. They go to the number one person in the class. What do you want? They're like, infantry. One slot came off the board. And um, right. so the people at the bottom of the class get stuck with, uh, oftentimes, a chemical core, unfortunately. Right. But, um, yeah, it's just, it was a great environment to be in. And uh, the, the academic training and the, the leadership training was just top notch. So. Why, why aviation? What drew you to that? Uh, if I'm being honest, uh, probably the movie Top Gun. That was a thing. Um, but, and I'd run into a West Point grad when I was, uh, that's actually why I applied. I ran into a West Point grad when I was coaching high school wrestling. His younger brother was a freshman that I was working with. And Ron said, hey, Navy is the same, or Army is the same application as Navy. He's like, scratch Navy out, write Army over top of it, send it in. He's like, you could possibly fly Rotary for, uh, for the Army. So that's what I ended up doing. Right. What happens after, so you, you get to choose where you want, where your branch, where, where your field. Yep. Um, where do you go after you graduate? So everybody heads to their officer basic course at that point. And uh, we actually, our, our class was unique. We had to go to Fort Benning and um, half our class went to Fort Benning, half our class went to Fort Sill. There was like a two to three year group of graduates. And um, essentially what happened was, so this is in 08, right? And if we think back to Iraq, 03, 04, we have the Jessica Lynch situation, right? So that's a non-infantry combat unit that's on an asymmetric battlefield, right. and they get caught up in a gunfight, don't know how to do you know, immediate action on their weapons, their weapons are in poor shape. All so they didn't understand how to do basic infantry skills. They were a, a rear you know, unit that's normally in the rear. So we had to send some, some, you know, some door kickers in to, to go, go rescue her, right? And um, in my opinion, the Marine Corps has always done this the right way, right? Everyone's a rifleman first. Right. So what the, the Army's uh, solution to this was, was we're going to send all of the officers that graduate in a given year from ROTC, OCS, and West Point all to this seven-week crash course on running convoys, infantry operations, uh, all the stuff that, and I didn't want to knock the, the program and like kind of, we had a lot of resources that these ROTC units didn't have, right? So we had the opportunity to, to train a lot more up at West Point, um, but a lot of the stuff we had already done. And they put us all together so that we were all on a level playing field. We knew how to do all the basic infantry things. In the event you found yourself in a position later in your career where you're, you're having to do hood rat stuff on the ground that right. is normally an infantry task. Um, you know, you're an aviator, you put a helicopter on the ground in Indian country and now you are, yeah. you were in a gunfight. You know, how do you handle yourself? Are you in physical shape to be able to do those sorts of things? So that was the intent of this, of this program, but, um, the trickle down, and then the plan was it was kind of trickle down economics, right? Like we would learn the skills and then we could kind of bring it to our individual unit. Right. It didn't really work out well, and it was a big waste of time and money to the point that when General Dempsey took over as training and doctrine command, he came in and interviewed a couple people at, at, uh, at Fort Rucker where we were at flight school. And my roommate was a former Ranger Regiment guy before he came to West Point, so he made a combat jump in Afghanistan, uh, you know, so one of the you know, tip of the spear units in, uh, in the Army Special Operations community. And Mark, General Dempsey came in and he literally asked the major that was in charge of the group to leave the room. He just wanted to talk to the lieutenants that were 
stuck there waiting to start training because there was a huge backlog in the training pipeline while we were there. And right. so General Dempsey like wants to have a legitimate discussion. And Mark is the only person that's been around the Army long enough to like identify immediately that like, because all the other lieutenants are scared to death. They're in there with a four-star general and they're all butter bar lieutenants. And he's just like, why are you all sitting here? And, and like everyone's like looking around and Mark's like, well, sir, like, she's been waiting seven months to start the OH-58 course and I'm sitting here waiting to start this and like whatever. So he wanted to know what was really going on, you know, have an honest conversation, but what was going on at Fort Rucker. And the other thing he wanted to know was, was Bullock to this course at Benning and Sill worthwhile? And, uh, and he was like, sir, it was a total waste. He's like looking down at his combat patch and his mustard stain and his jump wings. He's like, so it was a total waste of time, uh, not just for me, but for everyone. Like, that course shouldn't exist. And sure enough, a year later, they cancel the thing. Wow. Like, it's done. Uh, it didn't work out quite as well. But, uh, to, so we're down at Fort, uh, Fort Rucker. I spent about a year and a half in flight school down there. I actually wanted to fly an OH-50 Kai Warrior when I showed up. But then the training helicopter we fly basically is the Belch 06, which is a uh, civilian version of the, of the, of the Kai Warrior. Mm -hmm which no longer exists. They, they canceled that aircraft. Uh, it's not in the Army inventory anymore. But then I realized that flying a single engine aircraft is not ideal because you get one stray small arms round into a specific part of the uh, engine or, and you, you now have a significant emotional event. Right. So um, I was like, mm, not gonna fly this. So then it was on to trying to fly Chinook because they were doing all of the assaults in Afghanistan in the higher environment, uh, the higher elevation because they have the lift for it, and you can put an entire platoon basically on the ground all at once. And, uh, but there were no Chinook transitions at the time because the Army got itself into a 200% strength for lieutenant and warrant officers from the couple of classes before us because they're like, hey, we got to crank out Chinook pilots. So there were no Chinook sh slots available for my class. So then it was between an Apache and uh, Black Hawk, and I'll be honest, my personality is probably more geared toward being an Apache guy and I knew that, but again, there was a like a six month wait to even start the Apache course. Right. And then it was uh, it was like another, like the Hawk course was like three months long. And, um, and then we only had a month, one month wait. And then the Apache course was like five months long. So it was like, I've been in enough school at that point. I was just like, it's probably the last aircraft I wanted to fly, but I listed it as number one on my list. And uh, so I went through the Hawk transition got to the 10th Mountain Division up in upstate New York. And fortunate enough, I was able to get a platoon right out, of, right out of the gate. I didn't go to a maintenance company or a staff position. And we uh, did an eight month train up with the platoon and then deployed immediately to Afghanistan. I had the platoon for the first six months of the deployment. Uh, didn't, didn't give up the platoon because I was like, you know, bad at being a platoon leader, although I, if I knew what I knew now at 35 that I didn't know at 24, I would have been a much better officer, but that's how that goes. Um, but no, actually, I, I gave the platoon over to my classmate and company mate from West Point, Scott Covington, uh, who I'd known since, you know, summer 2004. Uh, I gave him the platoon because he had been on in the maintenance company, so you don't get to fly as much when you're on staff or maintenance. Right. Um, so that way we wanted all the junior lieutenants and we were actually, I was about to be a captain at that point, uh, the senior lieutenants or junior captains, everybody wanted to get platoon leader time deployed. So he took the platoon for the second six months of deployment. And then I went to uh, battalion staff. Right. How long was the training to uh, learn how to fly a black hawk? Uh, I think we were, I think we were about three months for the course. Um, but you've already, you've already basically spent, you, you know how to fly a helicopter at that point. Right. Um, because you find the training helicopter enough and it's much more cost effective to do that too. You're learning the systems of the aircraft. And then the next big thing you jump into is learning to fly night vision goggles. So right. um, that's you don't do that with the training helicopter. You do that with uh, in your advanced airframe, um, and that is that's no small feat. And it's probably one of the scariest things that uh, I think I've done in my life was uh, was flying flying night vision goggles. So what uh, what is the mission? Yeah, so we're a utility helicopter, uh, so you have UH, that's a utility helicopter. We basically replaced the Huey. So my company was an assault company, so we were designed to do air assaults. So you would literally land a platoon or a company of, of infantry soldiers, 
in an area uh, with multiple aircraft all at once, and then they would go out and do their their door kicking, um, you know, season hold terrain mission. But again, we're in Afghanistan. One of the bases I operated out of was 6,500 foot field elevation. The other one was 7,200 feet. In the summer, when it was, we're, so we're at a high altitude. It's hot. We were restricted in some cases to only being able to carry four to five passengers on top of our two crew chiefs and the two pilots, and we had armored plating that was put in the bottom of the air, so you're, you're more weight, right? So right. you get into the lift equation at that point, and uh, we needed some margin for, because when you come in to do dust landings and stuff like that, like you maybe require a little bit more power to successfully get the aircraft on the ground. So when we're trying to go into landing zones at like 8,000, 8,500, the, the Hawk just was underpowered. We didn't have the lift for it. Sea level, you can fly around 11, 12 bubbas all day and kick them out and you know, you have plenty of margin, but up at those altitudes, you don't have it. So what our aircraft ended up being used for mostly was uh, standard movement of personnel equipment supplies around the battlefield, VIP transport. We did a couple of CASAVAC missions. I was actually out on a, on a mission once and um, there's a, so around a lot of the Ford operating bases, they would have a ROS, which is a restricted operating zone because they had artillery or mortars at that location. So before you fly through, as much as you might want to rely on the big sky little bullet theory, um, when you fly through those areas, there's a radio frequency that's known. You're calling the ground unit and saying, hey, this is you know Gallant 1-1 transitioning airspace south to north, uh, request Roz and gun status. And they're like, Roz is active, guns are cold, thanks. Okay. You know, let us know if you need anything. Sometimes they'd call us and be like, hey, you're getting shot at. And we're just like, okay, thanks. Because like, unless aircraft's like, or you know, if you've seen it any war movies with like, unless you're getting, you know, air rounds are actually impacting your aircraft. Like you don't know, like so much rotor noise and stuff. Like you don't, you know, you have no idea. Um, and then, uh, so a couple times we were transitioning the airspace and one in, one in particular, I remember uh, there was a vehicle rollover. So they had a couple, couple of guys, um, <laughs> probably should have gotten in trouble for this. So there are a couple of uh, folks that uh, got injured, and we were about 25 minutes north. We're on our way to Bagram. We were 25 minutes north of our base, and I was flying with Chris Dickerson, who was our standardization instructor pilot. So he's one of the best pilots in the company. And the other aircraft, uh, I think, it was Johnny Blaze, and like I don't remember who the other pilot was. But so we called. So we're over the crash site. So to spool up our medevac down at FOB Shank, they're gonna run out to the aircraft, do their quick startup, fly north. So they're gonna have to basically spend like 30 to 35 minutes to just get on site while this person's in pain and needs medical care, right? Like we're over top of it right now. And the person, we were taking like two people up the bottom, like they're not in a rush. It wasn't like we we're flying a general or anything. And, uh, so we called back to, now we're not briefed to, to land to a non-standard landing zone. And normally they want, you know, they want like topography of where you're landing and do a slope analysis or their wires and they didn't want to do all this like stuff. But the reality of it and the funny part is like when we kicked the door in in Iraq and Afghanistan at the beginning of this, those kinds of missions were done based on like throwing a, a map out on the, the hood of a Humvee. And it's like, here's where we're going. Everybody good? Okay, we know the radio frequency, go. Well, now we're on a mature battlefield and the colonel wants to know everything you do up at you know, brigade headquarters before you do it. And it's like, that's not how this works. Like, how about you trust the pilots and like, let us do our job? So I'm flying with this guy, uh, Chris, and he let me, even though I wasn't a pilot in command, he let me pretend to be pilot in command for the day. And uh, he's like, you're making all the calls today, sir. And all the, you know, you're in charge of the aircraft, so to speak. I'm like, all right. So uh, anyways, we get on site, like whatever, and we call back to, uh, so we had to use the SACOM, I think, because it was over the horizon, and we had to hit up our battalion headquarters, like, hey, we're over site, here's the situation, like, whatever, and they're like, oh, we're spooling up the medevac, and like, Chris is like, uh, Chris was handling the radios, because I was flying, and it was like, hey, uh, I think they, if I remember how this went down, Grant, this is, this is like almost 10 years ago at this point, he, uh, I don't remember how the radio thing, but they basically told us like we weren't briefed to land there. And uh, Chris is like, yeah, you're coming in broken. Like, 
<laughs> turn the radio off and he's like sir how do you want to handle this i was like let's land and pick these guys up he's like okay i agree so anyways um we didn't actually land we sent the other aircraft in and they landed um but you know and they browned out a little bit with the dust and there were wires to the left of the road that they landed on but you know we got those those injured soldiers down to the base you know more than 30 minutes probably ahead and they got them treatment so um that was something we did we did sling load operations so we would do resupplies up to like observation posts um one of the more fun missions that we had was uh, doing speedball resupplies in the middle of firefights i did i think two of those so like you'd literally have a unit that was heavily engaged and whatever the case was and we would take a body bag with loaded in magazines like rounds already in them and water in mres and we would fly in and come in on a real low approach and slow down as best we could as we we're getting close to where our troops were and the crew chief would slide open the um you know the side door of the aircraft and they just push this body bag out and you know we'd fly over it like you know 10 15 feet off the deck mm -hmm. and i kick it out to those guys uh, in the middle of a gunfight so um you know they could keep keep fighting and then I think the coolest mission I personally got to fly, and this was like a personal, uh, this was like a perfect storm. So we're down at another base and uh, the vice president was visiting Bagram. So they sent our good pilots up there to help support that. So the battalion now is left with like the spare parts pilots, which I'd like to think I was a good pilot. Anybody who ever was a pilot likes to tell everyone they were good. Um, and I think I was pretty good for my like, how junior I was. And I was flying with one of the maintenance test pilots that day, uh, Rod, uh, Rod Williams. And I fin we finished our mission. And one of, actually my tent mate from basic training at West Point, John Chamberlain, who's a former 82nd Airborne enlisted guy before he came to West Point. John was the battle captain that day. So he was handling the radios and the battalion talk. And he calls, he goes, I called in for the end of the day. I was like, hey, John, we're done, you know, like, you know, we're signing off, whatever. He's like, hey, leave your leave your gear in the aircraft. Come to the talk right now. I'm like, all right. So they got a they got some intel that there was this meeting of of people that were on the JPEL list, which is like the I don't even remember what that stands for, but basically the bad guy list right. and for the the theater that we were in. And there was like a big meeting happening, and it was happening like inside of the ten mile tack ring of where our base was. And there was a ground force available right then and there for us to insert. So daylight, dangerous, you know, kind of like right. the whole Black Hawk Down thing. Like, right. we're going to do a day assault on short notice, like right. whatever. And so we came back to talk. We get briefed up on this or whatever. And now I am, I've been in country for like two months. I've flown maybe 100 hours in country plus my 200 hours on the, you know, on back in the States, 200, 250. I'm super green, but I'm flying with this like awesome maintenance test pilot. And uh, the battalion commander, the reason this mission executed was literally, because uh, again, all of our senior pilots are basically gone. So they would have stacked the crews with like seasoned people at this point for a mission like this. And uh, I like saw this happen like down the hallway in the talk and he pulled Rod, the pilot I was flying with the side, who's gonna be the air mission commander. He goes, hey, can the kid handle this or whatever? And he's like, yeah, it'd be fine. <laughs> so uh, anyways, we, the plan was we took uh, our two Hawks and we had two Apaches for coverage for this. We took the Hawks, landed a, landed us an assault force with both aircraft. And this was during the winter, so we weren't like power limited. Put in blocking positions around the target house. And then we, because we were so close to the base, we literally just turned, pulled max torque back, put it down on the ground. The assault force jumped on and then we flew them right back out full max power came in landed again so now we're coming back to the same lz twice so that's also dangerous yeah. daylight and we're within this was a uh, y landing so x is when you land like on the target house or at the assault house mm -hmm. a y landing is slightly offset but we were like absolutely like two to three hundred meters away like inside a small arms and rpg ra uh, range right. for sure so we landed um put the assault force on they didn't even have to do anything kinetic they pulled so the brigade that had been there a year, the infantry brigade, in that area of operation, it was the single largest takedown and hit from the entire year. Not only did they find uh, nine people from the the area of operation JPL list, two of the people on there was in the Afghanistan JPL list. So like these were people that 
were seriously wanted. And, um, yeah, so that was probably one of the coolest missions I got to fly, but it was, uh, I would have never been on that had we actually had our season cruise there. So that was fun. Tell me about you, you're in high school when you, when 9-11 happens and that's when you make the decision, I'm going to, I'm going to go fight for my country. Yep. Um, and now you fast forward, you're going through, um, you're going through West Point, you're going through your training, you've got to watch what's going on in Afghanistan during that whole period of time. Now you're there. What's it like? For you, you, your first combat mission, with all that in the rearview mirror, it's all come down to this one moment. Yeah, um, I, I got to tell you, like when you're flying, like you don't have the luxury to like think through things like that. You really have to be. It's it's that environment is so challenging that you 100% have to be task focused on what you're doing. In a lot of ways, uh, that causes problems, not just for pilots, but veterans in general. Like you have to be so task saturated on the things that you're doing while you're there because like your, your body, your adrenal glands, your pituitary is flushing you, doing all those physiological you know, um, nervous system things so that you are keyed up and, and focused. So that causes challenge a lot of times, and it did for me for a few, like two to two to five years after um, combat exposures. Typically, when people start having, you know, um, sleeping issues, uh, post traumatic stress issues start kind of popping up. For me, I was I was having problems with hypervigilance. I was not remembering dreams, but I was waking up like in cold sweats. People coming into the room were, were waking me up and freaking me out. And um, what I came to realize is uh, talking to you know psychiatrists and, and my doctor was. While I don't meet the definition for like post traumatic stress or anything, because it's it wasn't impacting my sleep to the point where I couldn't function during the day, and I wasn't having problems during the day where like I was like you know identifying threats that weren't there in the grocery store, or like see a bag of trash on the side of the road and think like it was an ID. It wasn't any of those issues, but what they uh, what they kind of ran through and what she helped me understand was even though I'm not a person who understands my dreams, that one of the things that happens um, that they're identifying is that everybody dreams. So let's say that I'm remembering flying a night mission under night vision goggles in a high enemy threat area, bad weather. Um, you know, by the way, night vision goggles restrict your field of view to 40 degrees. So it's like, it's like flying a helicopter while wearing binoculars. You have zero depth perception. So you can't, literally the way that we, we learn to fly visually, you can't tell your rate of closure and how fast you're coming towards something. You have to turn your head and look out the window, which depending on which seat you're sitting in, to see how fast you're moving and also watch your airspeed. So like, you can't, just looking forward, you have no idea how fast you're moving. Uh, everything's in a green monotone color. And then when you brown out, like you, and sometimes you're flying in such low illumination. Most people think like you can see everything under night vision goggles. There's such a low illuminate, like the, in Afghanistan, there's there's very little artificial light in certain areas. And you also have these high mountain valleys, uh, high mountains with, that cause these valleys. And then if you have cloud cover, there's no star illumination. Sometimes the moon angle is below the the actual, uh, or it's or it's the zero, you know, zero moon cycle, you know, so we call that red alum cycle. So what I started to realize was that I was having I was probably remembering flying these very challenging, you know, missions maybe, like when I was asleep. And what your body does is it actually mirrors physiologically what you're remembering. So you're, while you're asleep, your pituitary and your adrenal glands are flushing you full of adrenaline and all that sort of stuff. Somebody comes in the room, like you're keyed up, you, you're, you're up right. and you jump up pretty quick. So, um, yeah, that was something that I kind of like learned over time. And then also, um, I guess your original question was like, you know, what was that like? kind of come into all that one of the things that i i'm a little bit more of you know academically minded i read as much as i could about contemporary military history and the history of afghanistan before we got there so i knew some of the cultural issues and challenges and the fact that afghanistan had been a crossroads of you know empires for years and how the you know uh, the cars the central asian republic so like tajikistan uzbekistan like the five countries that are basically to the north and surrounding afghanistan um, how those those cultures and countries had the histories behind all of them and the fact that like the Afghan people, that country is so geographically separated because of the mountainous terrain and the ethnic groups that are in there. You have Pashtun, you have Azara, you have, um, you know, Tajiks that have, have you know, set, set, uh, settled in certain areas of the, um, of the country. 
it's really interesting to kind of understand, you know, before we got there that I'm not going to say who this was, but uh, a family member of mine was kind of one of those people that was like, well, I don't understand why don't we don't just nuke everybody there and like, you know, be done with it. And, you know, like, like, like what are these, what value do these people like bring to the world kind of thing? Obviously probably a very ignorant, you know, viewpoint, but I said, you got to understand, I said, like, you, like your son, right? Like, imagine if he grew up in the Northeastern United States and had only known the way of the gun his entire life, because that's what the average life expectancy of a male in Afghanistan, like, that's what they know today, right? Because they had the revolution in the 70s, the Soviets invaded, so they had the Soviet invasion for a long period of time, then the Taliban started to rise up uh, and started to gain power in the early 90s. By 1994, they were the main, being supported by the ISI and uh, out of Pakistan. They became the main dominant force in the country. By, I think, 1998 or 1999, with the exception of the Panjshir Valley, which is where Ahmad Massoud was the lone holdout warlord, um, the Taliban owned 95% of the, and controlled 95% of the country. And they lived under, you know, Sharia law at that time. But it was, it was, again, enforced by the way of the gun. And then 9-11 happens. And now we come in. Uh, one of my, my buddy that was a ranger in Afghanistan, Mark, he said that they got there. And this is a crazy story. Like, to, to, to understand that this is what you're, these are the people that you're, um, you know, working with. They came in and they were able to talk to some of the villages. They were in a very remote part of Afghanistan. They were able to talk to the village elders through an interpreter who knew Russian because one of the people in the village remembered Russian from when the Russians were there. And they were able to talk Russian. And they said, why are you here? And they said, well, this, this plane crashed into a building, killed 3,000 people, and that attack started here. So we're, that's why we're here. And the village elders said, and now they understood planes and helicopters because the Soviets were there. They right. see planes flying right. or they understand what they're but he said, no, no, no. And they point across the village. They said, can't build taller than that. It falls down. It falls down. So the, the lack of education, understanding of like the world outside of Afghanistan, they couldn't fathom a skyscraper. Like it just didn't right. exist in there. They live in a different world than we're used to. Yeah, in that consciousness. So um, I think what was interesting being in the country and, and working with Afghan population was kind of coming to that realization but also like I had to explain like I had to answer those questions for my soldiers like again we're there we're seeing that like this was I was there right at the end of the surge so I'm there like 10 through 11 we've been at more 19 years in that country right now right. and I'm having to answer questions halfway through the deployment or even a little bit later for my crew chief and they're like pardon my French but like my crew chief like sir what the fuck are we doing here and, and you know, you got to diplomatically like answer that because like try to keep like morale, but at the same time, like you got to explain like, well, hey, there's a huge historic context here and like right. all this stuff, but yeah, in reality, like the history book's gonna clearly show that like this was a waste of our time. This was a waste of blood and treasure there. Right. And again, I wouldn't have traded the experience for the world, and I, I'm proud of what I did there, and I was proud of more so working with the folks that I flew with and and the folks in my company, but. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that was kind of a unique. I guess I guess yeah. that was kind of my experience, like being there in country and having that all come to like uh, come to fruition there. What do you take away from your experience there, your combat experience? Uh, so, in a professional sense, and this is very hard to communicate to even being a West Point graduate with an MBA and a certificate from Georgetown and all the things on your resume, right? When you get hired some, somewhere, and I don't care whether you were a junior officer, whether you were an NCO, whether you were, you know, a little bit lower on the totem pole, and, you know, enlisted structure, and as pointed out by our lack of success there, we were largely thrown into an environment with a very shitty plan and limited resources and just told to figure it out. Right. So when you step into a corporation or a company or you build your own organization, you have the skill set to find ways to succeed. And that is more valuable than any college degree and 
any approach to problem solving. And we've grown these skills in our veteran community and then the folks that served in the military and not in all cases, again, to the pipeline right. example, like, right. you know, that's not gonna apply to everyone, but, um, and I think fortunately, uh, employers are realizing that there is a value uh, to having veterans there um, in their in their workforce and things like that. So I think that's the one thing that I took from, from my combat experience there is that, um, and another thing too is, you know, I. I, I work well under pressure, right? Like that's another thing you kind of learn is when you've, there's a book called In, In Extremist Leadership by uh, Colonel Tom Colditz. He taught at West Point when I was there. And uh, In Extremist is, I guess, for the Latin, the Latin root is for uh, at the point of death. And when you've lived and led at the point of death, um, warrior cultures throughout history, the Native Americans, the Spartans, they understood that their warrior class gained a knowledge and understanding that couldn't be gleaned from normal life and normal existence to the point that when the the legions came back from war they had certain members of the legion come and address the senate and explain what happened to so that they could help try to communicate that to the decision makers right to inform policy that's a major problem that we have in the country in my estimate because uh, when we made the decision to move the old volunteer force in 1974, about 330 members of the Congress and Senate combined were had veteran status. Today, that number's around 90. And so few people, um, you know, I think the number was like about 11% of the population in the country served during World War II. That fell to about 4.6, 4.7% for Vietnam. It's been like less than 1%, or it's like 1% in uniform currently uh, has served, but like half a percent has served in combat. So if you have such a small percentage of the comp country that has done it, and then also such a small percent that knows about it because they're in the family and they're, or they're in the local community, we don't understand the policy implications of committing our blood and treasure abroad. And I think it's leading to a lot of very um, negative foreign policy and uh, policy decisions because we have such an uneducated electorate about what our military does that then leads to uneducated elected officials and it's just a big vicious cycle. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little political with this, but I think that's another thing that I, I kind of took away from that is that that experience is extremely valuable. Uh, and you know, to the Native American example, same thing, like they, when they brought their warrior class back, like they had like a cleansing ceremony and everything to like recognize that They've gone and done moral harm abroad, and they want them, you know, to understand that like they're being welcomed back, and they know that they're going to be different now, and that's accepted. And I don't think America understands how to do that like we did in World War II. Right. Whether or not Afghanistan is um, turns out to be a waste of time or not, from a personal perspective, any any regrets about your your, your decision to join the service? And anything that you did over there? Uh, no. Um, you know, I, I did the things that were kind of asked of me. Same with my, my guys. Uh, I'm sure some of them might have some of the, you know, the moral harm uh, things that they struggle with. I personally, I, I've kind of come to personal terms with all of that stuff. So I think I've personally internalized a lot of that uh, appropriately. Uh, and I'm fortunate that that's the case. The only regret that I have really was like kind of what I said earlier, like, I had known at 24, 25, what I know now at 35, as far as like being a better leader and all those sorts of things, like I'd, have, I'd just been such a better officer, you know, and I would have been better, um, you know, better for my, right. the guys in my company. But, uh, but other than that, no, I mean, no, no regrets with my decision to serve or, or what I did in Afghanistan at all. Was there anything that um, specific that shaped your decision not to make a career in the army? Yeah, actually. So I got home and um, I went through my, my flight physical kind of eval and I was not able to continue to keep an upslip. I, I couldn't fly anymore. So with that happening at the time, so you keep understanding the timeline of this, 2011, when I was deployed and I was actually on my mid-tour leave, the sequester was signed into law, which was a permanent purposeful downsize and shape of the military. So Army Human Resources Command was projecting that they were going to have to let 7,800 officers go in about two years from my year group. 
So because they had a broken pilot that couldn't fly anymore, there was no ability for me to even transfer out of aviation into infantry or whatever. And I talked to our like our major um, at the uh, at, our, at Human Resources Command and said, "Hey, sir, like, w what can I do here?" He's like, "I mean, like, you can sit here and like not fly, and like, I'm gonna have to push you out in a year and a half or two years." He goes, "Or you can let them med retire you, which is beneficial in your your case." He's like, "And just get out." I said, "Okay." So it wasn't really my decision um, to get out, and that was a kick in the pants because I loved flying. And uh, I have flown a little bit on the private side uh, since, but uh, but yeah. So um, I made the most of it, and like I said, I took the skill set outside of um, outside of the military. I worked private sector uh, for profit for about a year and a half, and then I went and hiked the Continental Divide Trail for about six months. Okay. I needed to kind of clear my head, um, and I was getting ready to go to graduate school, so I did that before grad school. And while I was out on the Continental Divide Trail, I bumped into the run for the wall, which is the cross country motorcycle ride by which mostly Vietnam veterans get from LA to DC for Rolling Thunder, right. which is the motorcycle rally uh, at the Vietnam Wall in uh, in DC. And it, I think at the peak at like 08, it had brought like, I don't know, like something crazy, like 120,000 people to DC right. for that. So these these motorcyclists ride across the country on three routes and they pick up riders west to east. And I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico on my hike when I bumped into these, mostly guys, um, 250 bikes deep. And and for a generation of veterans that have been treated like garbage by their countrymen in a lot of cases when they came home and the, and how the divisiveness of the Vietnam War, here they were 30 plus years later, one of the most gelled and cohesive groups of veterans I had ever been around. And it begged the question in my mind, because by the way, there were there were already some GY vets that were riding, post 9 11 veterans that were riding with the Vietnam guys. Right. They joined this tradition. It really begged the question in my mind, well, two, one, in the next 10 years, these Vietnam era guys are gonna be trading in their Harleys and Gold Wings for Rascal Scooters and Walkers and Canes. Right. And the, so that was one thing. And I said, at a certain point, we're gonna hit a tipping point where my generation since we're already helping out with this and doing this, we're going to make up the bulk of the veterans doing this, right? Because like we're so many more of us compared to the Gulf War era in between. We're going to be the bulk of the riders. And at that point, it's like, what are we going to ride to? So uh, that summer, I spent a lot of the time on the trail thinking through like, how would you go about trying to get a memorial for the current conflict on the National Mall? I found out, uh, and I'll be as brief with this because I've I could talk about this for days. But I spent four years building uh, the nonprofit organization, the Global War on Terror Memorial Foundation. I spent most of that summer thinking through like how you would do that. Um, so it was a bit of a social entrepreneurship project. I started that as a side gig while I was going through business school, and it slowly took over my life. And uh, I was very fortunate; I was able to connect to Jan Scruggs, who's the gentleman who got the Vietnam Wall built, and Jan. Um, help connect me to General David Petraeus and General George Casey and General Conway and some people uh, with some deep pockets as well. And um, a few of those people were Admiral Tom Lynch and, and Rob Posner at New Day USA, which is the company that I now work at. That's our foundation's logo. And uh, the New Day Foundation, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll step back to the, the bill challenges. Uh, the bill in order for us to build a memorial on the National Mall, it required a piece of legislation being passed. The big challenge to that was that in 1986, Congress passed the 1986 Commemorative Works Act. And that act stipulated that a war or major military conflict shall not be considered by Congress until at least 10 years had passed from the official end of hostilities. So let that sink in with respect to the current conflict. Are we ever going to qualify for that? Like, Probably not. We still got guys engaging in the Philippines and the Horn of Africa and doing hood rat stuff in Syria and other places around the world, South America, all under the auspices of the global war on terrorism. Like that's still, that medal still being awarded to service members to this day. So we had to get a, an exception in our bill to a, basically exempt us from the original base legislation and then we had to get a bill passed. So I spent 17 months with a team of people lobbying on Capitol Hill while I was in grad school to get that approved. Um, passed the House unanimously. I got to testify before Congress. 
The Senate, they had a hearing on it as well. Uh, the Senate eventually passed the House version because the House version was, was through and they, they uh, didn't have to have a, Senate didn't have to have a committee hearing. So anyways, uh, passed, the, passed the House unanimously, passed the Senate in uh, August uh, 17th or 18th, President Trump uh, signed into law in 2017. So now we were legally allowed to do what we were trying to do and the charity was named as the charity to, uh, to do that. And then uh, how New Day got involved was uh, their foundation made a, a large commitment of money to the organization, and um, that gave us a little bit of seed money to actually start start moving forward. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of one of the things that I got involved with after uh, after my service. And that charity still exists. You're it does. Still, you're still moving forward. With it. Uh, I'm not as as involved with the organization. Okay. Um, I helped get it off the ground and kind of did I guess the entrepreneurial startup phase of things. Right. Uh, one of the board members took over and ran it for about two and a half years and they just changed leadership over and there's a, uh, another former army officer uh, with an MBA that's uh, leading the effort now. They have another bill in Congress to help give them their site where it'll be built. So that's kind of the stage of where that, but those those projects take about 10 years. Yeah. Uh, it's very bureaucratic yeah, in, sure. in DC. Um, so yeah. Our, our, our mission here at the American Wartime Museum, the Voice of Freedom, is to preserve stories like yours. We're hoping that somebody 50 or 100 years from now might watch this. What message would you like to send that person? So everything that, you know, I did in my military service and everything that we've seen in the last probably few years of um, how our com country has, has functioned or not functioned. And um, the government has probably not acted the way that it has in a lot, of, a lot of times. I think the biggest thing is democracy requires work and it requires sacrifice. And when you don't have informed people and an informed electorate, it can lead to really bad outcomes. And I think part of that, especially what I'd said earlier about the kind of foreign policy decisions, those viewpoints and the understanding that people that have served in uniform have about what war actually looks like and where and when we should commit those forces to do those sorts of things is extremely valuable. And it shouldn't really be overlooked. I'm not saying that veteran opinions or um, viewpoints are better or worse than regular folk, but they're different. And in a context of making decision making on where and when to commit our legions abroad, it's extremely important that that understanding be put to its best use. That's very good. Well, on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Museum, I want to thank you for sitting down and talking to us, telling your story, yeah. taking time out of your day. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to your country that continues on. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Dennis. Thank you.